Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship here in the Old Kip. And a warm welcome to those watching online and to those listening to the Dial a Sermon service. One or two items to draw your attention to. The lunches continue on a Tuesday. Um, please come along and enjoy a lovely lunch. The Guild's next meeting is on Wednesday and it's a bring and buy and a quiz. Um, the Duncan Morrow Prayer Group meets again ne next week. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah, 20th of November. It'll be a remembrance between next week. Yes, it's just it says October here. I was just thinking it's a wee while to... <laughs> so it's November um, for the next Duncan uh, Morrow uh, meeting. Also, can you please note that um, there is a list in the vestibule. We have been invited by St Columbus to join them for the Christmas party this year, which I think is on Saturday the 10th of December. So if you'd like to go to that, could you please put your name on the list? Um, and I think it would be good if we can have a, a representation going along to that. Um, this is one of the first of the United events um, that's being put on. Um, so please, if you can make it, uh, that would be great. Also a reminder, next Sunday is Remembrance and the service begins at 10.50 and not 11am. Uh, Our Warm Places be programme began on Friday and we had a couple of people came along. Um, so we've started, we're up and running uh, and I'm also delighted to say that uh, we have been awarded £1,500 from VASA. Um, towards the running of the event. So that gives us a good start um, to get the, the, the programme running. So if you know of anybody um, who might need to come along, who simply wants to come for a cup of tea and a chat, please tell them about it. And it would be good if some of you can just come along so that you're there, so that people have someone to talk to as well. Um, you don't need to have a, need a warm place to come to it. It has other uses as well. And finally, just a reminder to the Panto folks that um, there's a rehearsal tonight. Um, we're doing Cinderella again, although there's a couple of changes from uh, the last time. Due to political correctness, there are no ugly sisters, just two handsome gals. <laughs> there's no fairy godmother, just a gender-challenged mythical creature. <laughs> Sandra's not here. So, 7 o'clock tonight in the hall for our pantomime rehearsal. Oh, yes it is. Let's just sit quietly for a moment or two as we remember the folks in Ukraine. Thank you. Let's begin our worship with Tell Me the Old, Old Story.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we come once more to this familiar place, at this familiar time among familiar faces. We come as we have come so many times, to sing well-loved hymns, to meet well-loved people, and to listen again to well-loved words of Scripture. Speak to us through all we know and love so well. Eternal God, we thank you for all that is familiar, all that has become so much a part of our lives. But save us, we pray, from ever becoming over-familiar, over-familiar with you, so that we lose the sense of all we should feel in your presence, over-familiar with one another, so that we lose sight of the worth in each one of us, over-familiar with our faith, so that we come to see only what we expect rather than everything you would show us, over-familiar with the world about us, so that we fail to glimpse your hand at work in the wonder of creation. Eternal God, open our eyes to your greatness, our hearts to one another, our lives to all your people in every place, and our souls to the work of your kingdom across the world. Deepen our insight, increase our love, enlarge our vision, widen our horizons. And so inspired by all you have done, all you are doing and all you have yet to do. May we worship you more truly and serve you more faithfully to the glory of your name. And here is now, as we say our family prayer together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our reader this morning is Anne Drysdale. First reading is from Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us is one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many from one body, and each member belongs to us, all the others. <clears throat> we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. It in, serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spirit fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not pay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
We sing the hymn, Colours of Thee. second reading is from Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. When they came to Capernaum, when he was in the house, he asked them, What are you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop, because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word and to his name be praise and glory. Amen. Thank you, Anne. We sing... Father, I place into your hands.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Father, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. If there is one thing in this world I cannot abide with, it is people who are intolerant. One of the things that worries me most about the world today is the lack of tolerance and understanding. No one seems to be willing to try and see things from another person's point of view. No one seems to be willing to consider that maybe the other person has a point worth considering. Everyone, it seems, wants to be offended by another, what another says, even when no malice is intended. And even the Bible isn't exempt from this nonsense. Recently, a politically correct Bible was printed where God isn't referred to as our father anymore. It is he or it or father mother. References to the Jews killing Jesus are removed or rewritten to eliminate the anti-Semitic overtones. And instead of the son of man, Jesus is now the human one. We are rewriting history in order to make people feel better. In the nearly 60 years that I've been on this planet, I have to say that the first 20 were lived in a world far more peaceful, a world offering far more confidence in the future than the last 20. Even at the height of the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis, the world seemed a far more stable place than it is today. Even at the time when many West Indians arrived on our shores in the 60s and 70s, and Enoch Powell talked of the dangers of rivers of blood on our streets because of racial tension. The world seemed a safer place than it is today. When I grew up, you looked at a colored person out of curiosity because you might never have seen someone with a different color of skin in, in the flesh before. Now we wonder if they might be a terrorist. When I grew up, you listened in amazement to programs telling you about exotic places and people. And you dreamed of visiting such far-flung places. Now we send armies to destroy their culture, their heritage, and to try to make them more like us. Is it any wonder that our world is on the brink of meltdown when there is so little tolerance in the world? The creed of the world now seems to be, if you are not with me, you are against me. I wonder how many people realize that that phrase is actually a corruption of something that Jesus said. What Jesus actually said was this, he that is not against us is for us. He that is not against us is for us. He actually said the very opposite of what has now become the world's creed. The world wants uniformity, Jesus wants tolerance and understanding. So what made Jesus say what he did? The background is an incident where someone, not a disciple of Jesus, was using the master's name to drive out demons from people. John heard about this and stopped the man. He thought that only someone closely connected to Jesus should be allowed to use the power of his name to exercise demons. Jesus, on the other hand, looked at what the man was achieving and saw that it was compatible with his own aims. And so he was happy for the man to use the power of his name. Tolerance was what it was all about. According to Jesus, everyone has a right to their own thoughts and to their own beliefs. William Penn wrote, Neither despise or oppose what you do not understand. Good advice for our world today. Because there seems to be an assumption that Western-style de democracy is the only appropriate form of political system for all the countries of the world. And that any country that takes a different view is therefore automatically opposed to democracy and is therefore a threat to us. The same is true when it comes to religion. There is a perception that Christianity is good and that all other faiths are bad. And when you mix politics and religion, you have an explosive mixture that can and is tearing the world apart. Any faith 
religion, church or individual who claims a monopoly on God is dangerous and should be avoided at all costs. Remember, the world is round. It's an oblate spheroid if you want to be technical. It's close enough to being round. And you can reach the same destination by going in exactly the opposite direction. You can reach Japan by going either east or west. But we must not think of tolerance as a lazy acceptance of everything. There are those around who think that everything's okay. But to be a tolerant person takes time and effort. And an acknowledgement that the concept of truth is so big that no one person or group can ever claim to have a complete understanding of it. You still have to try and work out what it is you believe in. But before we decide that a system of government is evil or that a religion is not of God, then we need to learn all we can about them. We must not make snap judgments from a position of ignorance or listen to those who have vested interests. We need to find out for ourselves whether a political system is good or bad and what the aims of other religions are before we decide to support or oppose, oppose them. Truth comes in many colors and languages and is to be found in many strange places. The Bible also teaches that freedom, is, sorry, that freedom of speech is important if tolerance is to exist. But that does not mean that we can say anything we like. For example, if someone is inciting violence, then they need to be stopped. Not necessarily by force, as we seem to think today. Maybe a better way is to show why the person is wrong, rather than denying them the right to speak. The philosopher Voltaire once said, I hate what you say, but I would die for your right to say it. I wonder if many of the acts of terrorism that occur around the world and which we claim are the direct result of Muslim clerics inciting jihad, a holy war, are not so much the result of their words, but of our failure to show why those words are not true or justified. If someone claims that the West is oppressing people in the developing countries and it's not true, then surely we can find ways of showing the world that it's not true, rather than simply using force to keep them quiet. And if it turns out that they are true, then surely we are duty-bound to make changes to stop the oppression. Both the Bible and Jesus are saying to us, listen to what people are saying. If it's false, show how it's false. And if it's true, then do something about it. But don't try to shut people up just because they say something you don't like. And of course, I hope you agree that that applies to this sermon as well. But maybe the most important aspect of being a tolerant person is the ability to see the bigger picture. When, G when John came to Jesus and complained about the man using Jesus' name, all John could see was a non-disciple using Jesus' power. Jesus, on the other hand, saw the end result of the man's actions, people being healed. And that, for Jesus, was far more important than that the man was not one of his followers. In the eyes of Jesus, what really mattered is the end result. It is the fruits of our doctrine and our beliefs that really count. So what if a country is run by a dictator? So long as that country enjoys peace and justice. So long as everyone is cared for and valued. Just because the system of government is different from ours does not mean that it is inherently wrong and ought to be overthrown. Remember, our wonderful government is just as incapable of injustice as any other system. If we want to judge another country's rulers, then remember that God will use the same standard when it comes to our turn to be judged. And the same is true for other religions and faiths. As Christians, for us to assume that we have a monopoly on God is beyond arrogance. What we have to do 
is to look at the fruits of these other faiths to see if they produce good fruit or bad fruit. And as far as I can see, the Dalai Lama produces the fruits of peace and justice in his followers. And no one could accuse Gandhi of sowing the seeds of violence and war. If you want to discover the true value of someone's beliefs, then you have to look at the fruit it produces. And even if you don't agree with their beliefs, you may have to accept that it is God who is behind it. If it produces the good things that add to the quality of life of everyone. Now it would be easy to point the finger at the Muslims and say that at this point in time their beliefs seem to be producing violence and death. And therefore ought to be judged accordingly. But let's just stop for a moment. And remember that both Bush and Blair claim to be Christian. And so the whole of Christianity is tainted by their actions in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you don't have to look very far back in history to see the Christian church producing evil fruits. Remember when you point your finger at someone else, there are three fingers pointing back at you. There are many Muslims out there preaching peace and justice. But our media don't see that as newsworthy. There are many Muslims out there producing good fruits in their lives. But we don't ever hear about them. If we want to produce a safe, tolerant society, then we need to open our eyes to the wider picture. We need to open our eyes to what is actually going on around us. And we need to open our eyes and actively look for the good in others. Because I have no doubt that we will find it. Because God is working in many different ways in our world. And the final lesson that Jesus wants to teach us on the matter of tolerance has to do with inclusion. One of the fruits of intolerance is a desire for exclusivity. Only true believers need apply. For example, the Ku Klux Klan or the British National Party. Sadly, some churches still hold to the idea that some Christians are better than others. But what Jesus wants from his followers is never to exclude someone. Never to draw a circle that keeps people on the outside. Jesus wants everyone who follows him to make sure that the doors of their organization, fellowship or whatever are kept open for anyone to walk through. We may not like what some people think or believe. But we must never become a barrier to them encountering Jesus. Just think of the way that the early Christians welcomed Paul. The man who had publicly persecuted them into the ranks. If we want to change a man's mind, then we should do so by acceptance and persuasion. And not by threat of arms. Maybe... If each one of us here today were to leave this church more ready and willing to be tolerant and understanding, then the world would start to become a safer place. And maybe, just maybe, there would be less probability of us having to send our young men and women into war zones where they will run the risk of having to kill or be killed. As we move towards Remembrance Sunday, let's commit ourselves to becoming more tolerant and to creating a more tolerant and ultimately peaceful world. Why? Because that is what Jesus wants us to do. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these thoughts, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Let's worship God with our offering. Let us pray. 
Father, at this time when the world is struggling for the things it needs and wants, we give you grateful thanks that you provide for us. That when we rely on you, you provide all that we need. And often more than we want. So today is a token of our love and appreciation and of our hope that it might help others as well. We bring this offering before you. Accept it, bless it and use it that your kingdom might grow and that your world would be fed. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. A prayer for other people. Let us pray. Father God, as the winter comes upon us and as many people worry about what the winter is going to bring, we give grateful thanks for all those churches and other organizations who are opening their doors and offering warm places and warm welcomes to those who are in need and have nowhere else to turn. Father, we pray that people will use these places and that friendships and relationships would be developed, that good news would be shared, that people would feel comforted, accepted, that they would be given hope for the future. And who knows what might come from these small seeds that we are planting. Because in your hands, they could become a great harvest. Not only for the churches or for organizations, but for our society. If we can share more love and friendship around, then our community will be a safer place. And if our community is a safer place, then our country will be a safer place. And if our country is a safer place, then other countries too will benefit from that. Help us to remember, Father, that from small acorns do great trees grow, all because you make them grow. But we have to plant the seeds. Father, we pray for our governments in Holyrood and in Westminster, that they too would get a grasp of the issues in front of them, that they would show confidence and hope in dealing with them, that that hope and confidence would spread throughout the country and people might be able to lift their heads and look to the sunrise rather than the sunset. Father, we know that with you all things are possible, that what we think is impossible in your hands is child's play. And so we hand the political turmoil over to you and ask that you deal with it. Father, in the week ahead, help us as we leave the church today to be even just a small beacon of light in the darkness that others might be led to you. Bless all the small things that we do because often they are the things that make the difference. So be with us now as we leave this place and as we take your love with us into the world, help us to follow in Jesus' footsteps. This we ask in his name. Amen. Can I remind you of the invitation from St. Columbus for, to their Christmas party? And if I'd ask you, you could put your name on the list. We close with one of the great hymns. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
And now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love now and evermore. God bless and keep safe.